You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. Mark, I want to thank you for taking the time today to be on this, this week's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. Now, before we start, I really want to thank Robert Birch, who made the intro that allowed this episode to happen. So, Robert, thank you for being a fan and supportive of the show. But with that, Mark, can you give us, a, our audience, a brief introduction to your career up until this point? Sure. Uh, good, good to spend time with you, Sean, and thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, I'm, I've had a, a little bit of a different kind of a, quote, entrepreneurial career. I, I spent uh, the first 10 years of my career in what we'd call corporate, right? Uh, about seven years at IBM and three at HP. Um, and after 10 years in kind of big tech, uh, I'm, by the way, all in California. I'd grown up in Southern Cal and then w- moved to the Bay Area for HP for a few years. Um, I kind of came to the conclusion that pursuing kind of the corporate ladder, as they as we sometimes say, just probably wasn't the best path. So I got a chance to come to Austin, which uh, back in the mid '90s, which is when that happened, was not the place that everybody from California was going to. Um, it was not really established as a tech center yet. But I came here for a, a young, relatively early stage company uh, called Tivoli. Now, if you're an enterprise software, you may know that name, but Tivoli was kind of an early success uh, in in Austin in the high tech community. It went public. Uh, right after I got here, actually. And then it was bought by IBM. And I kind of rode that wave for the next about four to five years. And then a group of us who by then were kind of mid, let's call us mid to lower level executives at IBM. We said, you know, this startup thing looks great. It was still the late 90s, by the way, interesting data point here, like the the internet bubble had not yet burst the first time. So it was like really hip and cool to go start a company. Uh, You know, we should go start a company. So we did that at the very end of 99, headed into 2000. And then, you know, that turned out to be a, a rough time to start a company. Thankfully, we were not a dot com. We were not trying to be a consumer eyeballs play. Um, and then 9-11 happened. You know, there was just a lot of stuff in those early 2000s. But we we had a good, successful track record, built a nice little company that that grew over the first three to four years. And we sold that um, to Sun Microsystems when there was a Sun. Most folks in tech know that name Sun. Uh, they were a big a big, big player in the Valley for years, ultimately acquired by Oracle. And so, um, you know, af- after doing that, we thought, well, that was great. We should do something like that again. So we started this company, SailPoint, in 2005, uh, at the end of the year there, thinking another four, five, maybe six year startup journey, you know, but raise some venture capital, have a nice little run, probably sell it. That's literally what we all thought was going to happen. And to make a very long story short, that almost happened <laughs> about five or six years in, twice, uh, two different big tech companies almost bought SailPoint, and that didn't happen. Then in what was at the time unusual, we raised, sorry, didn't raise, we, well, we went out to raise what was called growth equity, kind of growth capital, mezzanine financing, all kinds of different terms out here. And on the way, a bunch of private equity firms showed up and we're like, that's weird. We didn't think we were the kind of company private equity company firms wanted to work with. And in retrospect, we were sort of at the front edge of PE firms getting into the growth game. They mostly bought broken old bad companies, frankly. Um, but this was sort of when some of them were starting to try some healthy growth companies and see what they could do. So this now well-known Silicon Valley firm, Toma Bravo, was that firm. They, they bought out all of our venture capitalists. We went in, in with those guys, thought Maybe three to four years later, there would be a sale, maybe to a strategic, a big tech. Instead, the company was doing well enough that for the first time ever, Toma Bravo considered taking a company public with an IPO. Wasn't the plan when we came together. This was 2014 when we came together. But sure enough, fast forward again, three years later, we did an IPO in 2017, had a very, very good outcome there. Toma kind of exited uh, after after about a year, a little over a year, kind of sold their their stake down, had very good outcome for their shareholders. And we just went on to being a public company for the next five years on the New York Stock Exchange. And late in ni- uh, 2019, listen to me, uh, late in 2021, we were still in touch with the Toma Bravo guys. And we had this conversation about what we saw happening. And again, to make a long story short, after some dialogue, we decided to consider going private go back off this market uh, with them. And we talked to other PE firms. I mean, ran a full process to make sure, you know, we were getting the best deal for our shareholders and ultimately went back with Toma to go off the market. That just closed last fall, August. And so here we are, a private company again. Um, So yeah, to make that very long story short, John, I went from a entrepreneurial venture-backed startup 
to a PE backed company to a public company, now back to a PE company with the most likely next outcome probably going public again, although we could potentially be acquired on that journey. So it's, uh, I tell people, these are the kind of things people do across their career. They just don't normally do them with one company. <laughs> so that's the unusual part of my journey is all these things with one company. Okay. This is an incredible story, especially, I don't think we've ever had a guest on this show that can talk about all these different kind of stages of the life cycle of a company going, you know, mostly here in Silicon Valley, it is angel VC acquisition, angel VC public. Angel VC, close the doors forever. No one hears of you again or, or something like in this nature, not this angel VC, private equity, public private equity. So in this journey, well, one thing that's amazed, amazing is that you were there this entire time. You weren't replaced after a series A or a series B round. So I'm kind of curious, what was the skill set needed at each of these different stages? How did you grow and adapt? to each of these stages of the life cycle of the company. And then, well, I really want to find out more about how each, each of these stages was so different in the company's mm -hmm. life. So a lot there to unpack wherever you want to begin. Yeah, boy, show this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, we will not burden your podcast listeners with a four hour podcast, but it, there's, there's a lot to the story, right? Um, yeah, a couple thoughts. I, partly you, you see only in the rear view mirror sometimes how some of the things earlier in your life pay off in ways you might not have thought, right? So the fact that I did spend 10 years in larger corporate settings, I knew some, and we got acquired, typically got acquired into IBM, uh, our first startup wave set got acquired into Sun. I had been a little bit more back and forth across that line maybe than some people. So I'd seen large scale corporate, been in a division effectively, uh, lead, divisional leadership, so to speak. And so I, I wasn't completely unaware of, or frankly freaked out by, larger stuff. I, I enjoyed that early stage and wanted to build something. And that kind of the, the camaraderie of the early stages of a startup is just so fun and so energizing and all that. But as we kept growing, I kind of thought, well, I'm still enjoying this part. <laughs> this is a little bit different. Um, and so up to the point we that SailPoint almost got acquired like Waveset had, and that was about a four to five year part of the journey. That all felt quite familiar, right? So that first startup was unfamiliar the first time, but once we did it and we sold it, then started this company, we thought, okay, we know how to kind of, ideally, there's, it's never easy, as you say, but how to come out of the ground, raise some venture. We were very fortunate, by the way, in that story, Sean, I know such a big part of the Valley, you know, landscape is venture capital and angels, like you said. And we had a couple of venture folks here in town, and that led us to a venture firm who's well-known in the Valley called Lightspeed. That, that, that journey the first time was a little bit, um, you know, uncertain, so to speak, like, okay, we had to get those first things set up and then meet the folks from Lightspeed, a wonderful guy, Ravi Matre is still at the firm, I believe, last I checked. Um, and, and so that was kind of unknown. When we did SailPoint, all that was known, like we went right back to the two for Austin Ventures in Silverton here in Austin, and then Lightspeed. And so raising venture for this company was easy because it was the same people and we knew them and they'd had a good outcome and they're like, yeah, fun. Let's do that again. Right. So that part up through about year five or six was pretty straightforward. And then going into PE was a completely different and new thing. Lots of learning, lots of, of, of unfamiliar territory. And then certainly as we got laid in that journey and it was going well and the IPO thing started getting floated, floated. Um, <laughs> I guess the honest truth is I remember kind of coming to a fork going, do I not want to do this? Am I willing to do this? It wasn't something I certainly had always wanted to do. I, I know some founders, you do too, I'm sure, who like, I'm going to take a company public, right? Like, well, that could be a dangerous thing to hang your hat on because you have a not a lot of control with, as to whether that ever happens. And to your point, I think you said this earlier, not a lot of founders get to ride the journey all the way to the IPO. <laughs> um, so even if you built a great company, quite often, you're not the folks that are the right team to go to that level. And because we were, quote, uh, what's the word, seasoned, mature uh, founders, um, you know, we founded this company, I think, when I was like 40 something, 40, 43. Is that right? No. I'm sorry. No, we founded this one when I was, yeah, no, 43. That's right, 43. So, you know, we were not brand new folks. We had been in leadership and management and had teams. So, 
there was a sense that our venture and our ultimate PE managers and owners kind of saw us as potentially able to lead to the next level. So there was some, some really fascinating juncture points, you know, should I exit now? And I, I, there's a humility. I, I hate to use a word that we don't talk about a lot, Sean, but there's a humility I think you have to have in this game, which was, I would say to the board, look, if I'm not the right guy to lead it to the next stage, you should just tell me, I think I'm doing okay. I'm still enjoying it. But if, if it's time for me to hand off the reins, I will, because I'm a shareholder, large shareholder, and I, I want the right outcome for this business. I don't want to hold on to the wheel and drive, drive it Thelma and Louise style over the cliff. That's not a motivation, right? So there were some good junction points where I think there really were some questions in my mind and the board's mind. Is this still make sense? Probably the biggest of which was going public. And then when we went through that gate, um, that's, that's a big unknown for a lot of folks. And then you go through it and you're like, okay, it's kind of different, but it's not terrifying. It's just weird kind of being so much of your life being out in the public domain. Um, and then after I got used to that for a while, this thought that we recently had of going back to private equity wasn't really scary because I've been there, done that kind of thing. Right. So it's, 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 I, I want to stop and let you ask some more questions, but it, it's just been this kind of like at each juncture, it's like, huh, this is still fun. And I think it's going well. And the board seems to believe that I'm still okay doing the leadership thing here. Yeah, let's go on. But to your point about how we should maybe make that the next thing, how, how to navigate that was, was a lot of, a lot of interesting conversations. <laughs> well, I'm just really wondering about kind of, was there any skill sets or anything that you had to adapt maybe in terms of communicating with the board differently at each of these stages or communicating internally with the team? Cause at the beginning it's, you know, everyone's name and then towards, you know, later on, it was probably more like, hi, stranger. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, that it's so true. And, and, and you just nailed it. I, the way I say it, Sean, is like the principles don't really change or, or said another way. Like I, I, I wrote one book and I, mean, I may never write another one, but I wrote a book about um, kind of how to think about it's, it's really about culture at work. I, I, that's not, that's not what it says in the title, but that's really what it like. How do you reinforce values and culture at work? And, and you therefore could get to the term principles from values and culture. And so the, you just, let's go back to your example. The principle I believed in hundred percent was to be as open and transparent and highly communicative as possible always. Well, when the company has 20 people, that looks like a Friday afternoon beer around the pool table, right? Let's, let's all grab a beer. We'll just talk about how the week went. How's the product coming? Did we have some interesting customer conversations? You know, that's that's the era when, you know, the engineering team is the largest team in the company and it's eight, you know, and you might have one or two salespeople and one or two finance people. I mean, like the departmental updates. <laughs> well, let's hear from Bob. Let's hear from Susie, right? Um, and then as you grow, then not everybody's in the room. Then another big step, not everybody's in America. <laughs> um, so you got time zones and cultures. The principle of transparency, the principle of communication doesn't change. And so the term I've sometimes used is the mechanisms continue to adapt. But right? if you believe that the right thing to do is build an open, transparent culture, and by the way, that got tested and twisted a little bit in going public. Because once you go public, guess what you can't do at the end of the quarter? You can't say, hey, we just had a great quarter. You can't say that. You have to wait till earnings are released to the public which is weeks later. So the one of the weirdest things was walking around the halls after the close of a quarter or the close of a year, trying to keep a complete poker face about how it went, right? You're like, how's it going? Fine. Everything is fine. <laughs> right? So like there, there's some real adapting along the journey at these various uh, stages. But what always worked for me was to hold on to principles, right? Um, and then like your other thought was kind of communicating with a board. Yeah, that was pretty different too, right? Early on, classic venture back company, you three to four board members, no one of whom typically, and we were pretty typical, I think this way, no one of whom had a majority, but jointly had a majority, right? The, the sum of the venture guys owned the majority of the company, but there's still kind of plurality going on there, right? They've sort of got to come together and work together and think about things and and therefore, there's kind of a nice, I'll call it some good balance there of, of the team. Going into the PE thing was pretty different. I mean, I'm a huge fan of my buddies at Toma Bravo, but like all of a sudden we had one voice at the board, really, not 
three or four and like, oh, this is kind of different, right? Um, then we go public and it's the opposite. You go to this incredibly dispersed ownership structure where nobody owns more than a few percentage points of the company. And there are some important influential shareholders, but you don't have this sense that any one shareholder has that much influence, right? Now, now we're back to PE. So it's like, there, the, 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 again, the principle of communicating with your investors is always true. They, they've invested in your business. They deserve to be told how it's going and what's working and maybe what's not working at some level. But how you do that, the numbers of conversations and people that engages, it's just quite different along the journey. I've, I've postulated, I, I will probably never go test this with a calendar uh, app or something. I've postulated that over the course of the whole run here, which is coming up, just past 17 years, actually, last year, that I've always spent about 15% of my time with investors, 15 to 20. You know, early on, that was with three primary venture firms. Then for a while, it was with one PE firm, but a bunch of different partners and a lot of depth in those conversations. Then a massive amount of investors at conferences and calls after earnings. Now back to one PE firm. But I'm pretty sure the number has always been greater than 10% of my time and probably less than 25. It might vary from 10 to 20, you know? over time. But it's like, huh, I think just being a CEO, you got to manage investors, whether you got one or three or hundreds, <laughs> you know, that's kind of the game. Now, would you say that the amount of time spent with investors was kind of the biggest surprise or shock on this journey? Or was there something else there that that kind of stands out that like, oh, I didn't expect this to to happen or or, or be this way? Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say that was a shock. I think it was more, you kind of use the word skills before. You have to learn some different skills, I think, with different kinds of investors, right? There, there was a sense that the, the VCs, I had known some of those guys a little bit or before as well. And so, yes, they're your bosses at one level and they own the majority and they can, of course, any board can always fire the CEO. That's part of the gig, right? Um, but there was a sense of mostly being on the same side of the table. And we're working together to build a successful thing here. And, and after the initial kind of getting to know each other phase of the PE firm, very similar, like, hey, together, we are trying to build this. I think when you have institutional investors, it, it's less of that feeling. It's more of a arm's length. You have a bunch of software stocks you invest in. I have a bunch of investors. So I appreciate the insights and, and observations of some of the, the folks that held larger stakes or that were really long-term, deep investors in our segment of security software, things like that, Sean. But yeah, I'd say it, it did probably vary more public from non-public. But but PE and VC, while different, in some ways, those are more similar because it's a handful of people that you're spending a lot of time with, and they're deeply, intimately involved with the details of what's going on in the business, way more, say, than an institutional investor from a Fidelity or Vanguard or whatever, right? What about the company itself? I mean, not so much you and the C level, but did mm. you notice the company itself change at all during these these stages? Yes, but but maybe not in all the ways some people might think. Part of it is the kind of mentality you attract, and what I mean by that is, you know, when you're building a very early, especially the first time, if I'm honest, but even our second time here at Sailpoint, when you're building in a very early stage venture back software company, most folks are smart enough to know there's a fair amount of risk that that may not ever go anywhere. Your your story of the the guys who take Angel and VC and go go bye bye, right? People know that happens a lot, right? And so you attract the kind of person who is willing to take some level of risk. Now, to be fair, at Sailpoint, it was our second time we had had a good outcome. So I'd say some number of folks look at that as quite a bit less risky than an unproven, never done it before entrepreneurial team, to be fair, right? But but certainly compared to the risk of going to an established, well-known brand, yeah, different, you sort of attract a different risk tolerance, I guess is the term I'd use in those early stages. And on the what do you need as the leadership team, you need people who can operate with less structure. I used to joke that in our sales model, right? Early on, you sort of want the the commando hacking through the jungle with a machete because there's no path. They're figuring it out, what's working, what's not working, how do we get this message or this value prop to resonate with customers, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, years later, when you've got a very large team, that's the last kind of thing you want 
for your leadership in sales. You want a general who's commanding an army, right? Like we are all going to learn how to do this the same way so we can repeat it over and over. And, and those skills are pretty different. They're both incredibly valuable at different stages of the company, right? But if I look at some of the leadership, I just to some folks who are still good friends of mine and I love them, the leadership in the sales function, for instance, in the early days, those folks would not be the right folks for the late stages and vice versa, right? Like early on in the bubble, you know, Sean, that we talked about that original internet bubble in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, you saw a ton of startups go recruit big name players from big name corporations. Like I got the guy running blah from big company X to come to our startup. And most of the time that stuff blew up because you can't take a guy who's had a staff of 10,000 and drop him into a team of three and go, you go, got this, right? Like, they're like, what the heck is going on here, right? What, where's my staff? Where's my team? Where's my administrative support? Like, uh, what are you talking about? We don't have any of that stuff, <laughs> you know? So like, there's just a huge like context uh, that changes is the word I guess I would use here. Like the context of what's going on and the skills needed are so different um, in those early stages. And then you, and kind of, there's different schools of thought as to what revenue levels here matter and all that. I, I don't know. There's probably no hard and fast rules. I felt like there's kind of a zero to 10 or 20 million that's really hard, like getting something out of the ground that's never existed before. And then there's kind of an early mid thing, kind of maybe 20 to 50 or 20 to 70 million or something. And then you sort of get into late middle, you know, kind of like 70 million to a couple hundred million. And, and if you get to that stage, you're kind of an IPO candidate in the world today, two, 300 million. And then there's the, you know, kind of super scale some, somewhat like, and, and again, we're, we're a company that doesn't yet gotten to a billion in revenue. If things go well, we'll get there someday. But like, then you got the guys that are a billion to 10 billion in revenue in the world of tech. And that's just a, a level. I, I don't know if I'll ever get to do that here, by the way, but um I think there's just a sense of all those are kind of different skills and different kinds of leaders required. Now, I've been fortunate, and I could say to some of my colleagues, people can move. <laughs> they can migrate and learn and grow because, you know, everybody at some point had to do something for the first time, right, by definition. But there's a sense of when do you know I really need somebody experienced who already gets what we're doing at this scale or even beyond this scale so they can take us there? And when do I keep relying on folks that have been here and know us deeply? They understand the company, they understand the market. And, and my view has become, back to things I've learned, is that you always want some blend, right? You always want some blend of, of familiar, loyal, know what's going on, and some blend of new, fresh thinking, experience at a higher level of, of growth. Because if, if you tip toward only one or the other, I think they both have clear problems, right? Um, so anyways, that, well, that's kind of one of the things I've learned about that along the way. Well, question right there. How do you go about having those difficult conversations with someone that, hey, you've been at the company six, seven years, and Bob yep. over here is coming in and is going to be your boss? And you're like, wait a second, I've been here since early on. I, shouldn't this role be my? How do you go about having that conversation and really sitting down and going, hey, you know, it's for the company. Yeah, very insightful question, Sean. So um, I learned that this was a great learning from company one, which only ran for four years, by the way, with this other company was called Waveset. It was, it was zero to sold in four years, almost to the dot, literally. And so literally, I, you know, folks didn't know venture, like as we were doing our final vesting of our initial stock grants is when we sold the company, like boom. Um, so so I didn't really get to experience that in that there was a little bit of upgrading in, in that four year run, but generally the people we got early on that could lead kind of led through that whole run for the most part. So this is a 17, which is well to say 17 year old company now. So at various points that was clear, something needed to change. And so back to your question, sometimes people themselves would see I love it here and I love what I'm doing, but I am self-aware enough to know I don't know that either I want to or am capable of or should do the next three years. Say I've been here three or four years and and got us from X to, to Y, but from Y to Z is going to be a whole different journey. And sometimes those people go, look, I don't even know if I want to do that. Um, and sometimes you'd have healthy conversations with folks and go, hey, 
I think you're awesome. And if you're willing to stay and work for somebody who's going to be the experience leader above your level, but I would encourage that person to keep you because I think you're still adding a ton of value. That's happened. We've done that a fair amount of times. And I think, by the way, that only works when you have a pretty healthy culture that people like, wow, I, I so want to be a part of this team and this culture, I will quote. And, and some people call that a demotion. It's not a demotion. You're, you were, you were, you're still leading something probably comparable to what you were leading before, but the thing is now much bigger, <laughs> right? So you were, I'll make it up. You were the VP of something with 40 people. Now the thing has 400 people. A director leads teams of 40 and the VP or the SVP leads teams of 400. If you're really good at like leading 40 people, we'd love to keep you here doing that, <laughs> you know, but you get into titles and compensation and some other tricky stuff, right? But, but there's a sense of what does the business need? What does that individual like to do? And what are they good at? And sometimes that allows you to keep people growing with the company as it scales. And sometimes any one of those is this isn't going to work for the company or this is not what this person is good at, or frankly, this is not what this person wants to do. So as I look back to those really early days, a lot of my good buddies and friends who helped us in those early days, after four, five, six years, a lot of them cycled back into another set of startups, which was the exact right answer for them, right? Like good for them, good for those other companies. And as we got bigger, they didn't really find that this was the right fit for them anymore. And and then, then I sometimes get the obvious question, well, how come you're still able to do this? And, and here's the answer I would say, like, look, at the end of the day, I've always managed a team of about six to eight people. That's what you do as a CEO. Now, early on, some of those people managed zero to three people each, or maybe 10, right? Today, they manage 10 to 20 people who manage 10 to 20 people who manage, you know, like companies like 2,500 people now. So my day-to-day -day inner circle has always been about six to eight people. So I'm like, well, if I'm setting good direction, we're holding on to our values, we're making sure people are clear on the objectives and goals for the business, we're reinforcing our culture. Turns out, in some ways, my job changes less than anyone else's. Um, very few people think of it like that, but I kind of think it's true. Like, I, I got to hire great executives and make sure they know how to execute to achieve success at the level we're at. And that's changed over time. Almost all of my current executive team was not here at the beginning. As a matter of fact, all of my executive team. Some of my executive team has been here a decade. More, more of them have been here two to three years now. Um, so it, it, it was a thing of over time. My, my ex-executive teams who I love and I'm still good friends with, some of them retired. Some of them said, I want to go back to something smaller. Some of them wanted to go off and lead their own thing, which I would go, that's great. Good for you, you know? So I think there's, there's just, when you have this long a journey, you, you see a lot of stories, I guess, right? On this journey, did you ever have any coaches, mentors, advisors, or was it just more feedback from the board? No, I, I, uh, I, both hands, John, I, I, um, this will be a little pokey maybe for some of your listeners. I, I'm not a big fan of entrepreneurs who say, I don't want to raise money or I don't want to board because I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I'm like, then you are essentially telling me you think all by yourself in your own brain, you have everything it takes to be successful. Good luck with that. <laughs> right? Like, you know, what all kinds of phrases in the vernacular now, the wisdom of teams, like none of us is as good as all of us is one phrase, right? Like you always want a team mindset. So with that backdrop, like I'm always been a team guy. Well, I've always listened to my boards because they see things from different angles. They're working with multiple companies. They're going to see some stuff. I've always worked with some flavor of mentors and coaches and some flavor of peer, what I'd call peer advisors as well, right? So it's sort of the thought of, I got board people, investors and financial managers and operational managers who really have seen some aspect of this journey before. I've got somebody who's maybe just more, um, so to speak, in my corner, that, that would be the mentor coach. Like they're not, they're not necessarily um, a, a fiduciary or, or a shareholder to where they have a mixed um, motivation. Uh, do they want to be my friend and help me or do they want me to get out so they'll make more money in the stock, right? Like you start with somebody who's like on, in your corner, so to speak, as a mentor and a manager. And then I think the peer thing is just the world is shifting and changing so fast. You just sort of want to be talking to other people in similar situations like, hey, what are you doing about this or that or the other thing? Um, gosh, Sean, you can imagine in the last three to four years, there was so many, quote, unprecedented things we were dealing with more of that peer stuff than I think I've ever 
experienced ever in my leadership career. Like we were all going, how do you deal with this pandemic thing? How do you deal with some of this kind of the, I'll call it racial tension that was sweeping through America through some of these things, the, the diversity and how do I, how do I say the right thing, but not accidentally the wrong thing about being supportive of this stuff? Like it just, boy, there was a lot of hard stuff that we were walking through in the last few years. And I just think you'd be crazy not to be trying to talk to mentors and boards and peers about how are you working through this? I, I'm thinking this is the right answer, but what do you think? Right? So yeah, I, I, there are a handful of, I guess, incredibly talented people that can get to this level of success by themselves. I am not one of them. <laughs> I needed folks around me for sure. Well, to piggyback on what you just said, how do you think, I mean, the last few years, leadership has, has been tested. How mm -hmm. do you think your views of leadership might be different from your peers? How might it be similar? What are your views overall of leadership and the importance over the last few years? Yeah, I uh, I think kind of tying into the last point there, I think leadership got tested a lot in the last few years. And and just culturally with what we've been through, everything from social media to just kind of the the transparency, sometimes over transparency, I guess, uh, of what's happened in our culture, this whole, you know, to use a buzzword, authentic, right? Authentic approach is like, I think leaders who were purporting to be one way or positioning or, or posturing one way, and then it becomes clear that's not really who they are or how they think, boy, that, that bites you pretty hard today <laughs> in the world. I think leaders who are not consistent, you know, who, whose walk doesn't equal their talk, as we sometimes say, um, I think that's been called out a lot. Um, I think, so I, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I've always believed that stuff to be very true. I never tried to create an aura or a persona that wasn't who I really was because I didn't think I could keep it up, frankly, if nothing else. Um, somebody wise once said that one of the main reasons not to lie among many others is you don't have to remember what you said, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> if you just say the truth, then the truth is still the truth later. So you don't have to remember what you made up that wasn't the truth. Um, and so I think there's a sense of leaders had to kind of come to grips with, I'm going to get a lot of pressure and exposure and uh, that that's either fine with me or not fine with me, or I better, I better kind of decide what I really believe or think, because I'm going to have to be consistent about that and how I lead. Um, you know, the good news, uh, another macro trend in leadership that again, I feel blessed that I always kind of thought this way in some ways, I, I call it the, the mixing of, and boy, I'll probably get in trouble with this, with what's going on in culture around gender, the mixture of what I have traditionally been masculine and feminine leadership traits. I mean, kind of the command and control model of leadership was sort of what I grew up in 40 years ago. You know, I, I used to say, you know, most corporate leadership structures were modeled on the military. Everybody kind of knows that, right? Kind of command and control top down or, or orders are given <laughs> and obedience is expected. And over time, right, we got into way more of the empowerment mindset and empathy as leaders and caring about culture and caring about empowerment and caring about how people are treated. And to be truthful, Sean, eh, some, some ways, particularly in the Valley, we might have oversteered on that a little bit during kind of the early 2010s and, and stuff. And, and so now I think we're kind of in a getting, not there probably, but getting to a healthier leadership balance of you kind of need both of these schools skills in your toolkit. There are times when you need to say, look, this is what we're doing. This is where we're going. Need you to get in line and go. And if you don't want to, that's okay. We'll probably have to find someone else though who does want to do that. And, and in other ways, you can't just give orders and expect obedience in today's world. Like you've got to kind of understand diverse viewpoints and, and be empathetic and listening. We've seen a lot of tone deaf stuff, right? Like leaders who just come out and say, this is happening. And there's a massive revolt <laughs> on, on their teams, right? Like, did you ask anybody before you just shot off your mouth on that or what? Like, you know, I think there's this balance of, of kind of, again, traditionally, not, not, not true today, probably, but traditionally what we're thought of masculine kind of driver things and feminine kind of caring things. I would argue good male and female leaders today operate in both, in both vectors, right? They, they understand the importance of both strong leadership when recalled for and always compassionate, empathetic leadership, right? And you got to do both. I guess a little bit deeper on that one topic, kind of curious Company culture. I mean, it was mentioned a little bit earlier on, but 
you know, right now, so many companies have brand new CEOs taking the helm and maybe aren't familiar with that company's culture. Who knows? But what do you see as kind of, you know, companies right now missing when you talk to them about corporate culture? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know, Sean, I think culture still sometimes gets badly twisted into what I'd call sounding French and fancy, the accoutrements of culture or the, the, you know, the vestiges of culture. Like, look, I've always said this way to our team. If, if you have free beer in the fridge and free breakfast tacos, which is a Texas thing, and maybe out in the Valley, it's free massages or a, or a barista, whatever. Like at the end of the day, if you have a sucky company culture where people are treated badly and people don't trust management, no amount of free beer and free tacos will keep you there for very long, right? So this idea that culture is about that stuff is stupid. Culture, I love this simple definition. I can't remember who may have said it first. Culture is just how we do things around here. <laughs> That's culture, right? Like how do things work around here? How do we communicate? What kind of expectations are set? How do we hold people accountable? How do we set goals and how do we reward people and or not reward people for getting or not getting to goals? I mean, all those things about how things work, how you how you operate, how you execute, how you plan, how you strategize, how you have fun together, uh, the amount of fun you have together, all of that is culture, not just the fun stuff, not just the food and the accoutrements, back to the fancy French word I can't say. So there's 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 that. I want to break that. There's too much of that. And the Valley's got some problems here, right? Having been in California now a Texan for almost 30 years. The Valley gets really hung up on some of that culture stuff and uh, the way they define it, I should say, hung up in the, in the wrong definition of culture. Like, yeah, as long as we have all this great stuff, you know, everybody's going to love working here. It's like, nope, not really. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, um, I think you and I, before we got on, on the mic, we're talking about Patrick Lencioni. He's written some great books about corporate culture, corporate health, I think is his term. And that idea that things that make a company healthy are about leadership and compassion and vulnerability, but also accountability and transparency and holding people to what they say they're going to do. Like all that is what constitutes a good or not good culture. And then all that fun stuff that's kind of fringe is it does matter, right? I, it does matter that we have fun together and we have parties and we celebrate stuff and we do provide free beer in the fridge. Right. But but at the end of the day, none of that stuff's going to keep people in a, in a place they, they don't think they're valued or, or there's no dignity, to use the fancy dignity word, right? Like, if people don't feel honored and valued, they're not going to stay working for somewhere for very long. They will for a little while. That's what sometimes confuses people. Uh, I think what the term for that is combat pay, right? I'm being treated really badly, but they're paying me a lot, so I'll put up with it for a while. Um, or, or my stock is so valuable in the up into the right world we've just come out of. I just can't walk away from that. And I look at some younger people times ago, yes, you can, <laughs> because it isn't worth like the stress and pain in life to make a little more money. Don't, don't get caught up in that. Like don't, don't be the highly successful financial person who's made a ton of money at age 55 or 60 and their marriage is in tatters and their family's in tatters and their health is in tatters. Like that's not a life you want. Don't, don't, don't land there. So you got to, figure out how to have a, a good life as you're building a successful company. And that's, that to me is what a culture does. It creates an environment where people can have a good life and build a successful business. Now, speaking of good life and building a successful business on this journey, what was your favorite part of it? Was it building it from idea to MVP or mm -hmm. from MVP to get it out to the market or the lifespan, what did you really yeah. enjoy? If you had to just keep repeating one part over and over again, what would you do? Groundhog day. Um, so you, you may or may not love this answer, Sean, but here's what I always say to that. I've enjoyed all of them and had issues with all of them. And the metaphor, since I am now a grandparent of seven, um, is parenting. I'm like, I look at parents and I say, hey, okay, what was your favorite part? Was it having a two-year-old, a five-year-old, a nine-year-old? And very few people say my favorite was 14 or 15. Eh, this could be rough teenage years. Um, now my kids are in their 30s and late 20s. I've got grandkids kind of all 10 and under. And the truth is, I think if you're a healthy parent, healthy, hopefully in a healthy marriage, family relationship or whatever, like you have very fond memories all along that journey and some really crappy memories all along that journey. 
And it turns out, in my humble estimation, it's exactly analogous to the company thing. Like, I loved some of those early stages, just brainstorming, figuring stuff out as we go, new market, let, we're going to go take on these big guys, we're going to build something. And some days it was terrifying, and you're like, I don't know if this is going to work, uh, we may blow up and this thing may die, you know, like, and and now at this stage of life, like, I don't worry every day whether we're going to make it or not, <laughs> you know, like, I think we're good. Um, but there's another set of worries about how do we continue to grow and how do we establish a great competitive market position? And, and every point along there, it, it's been some amount of joy and some amount of really fun things happening. I guess in some ways, and this will sound trite, but oh, well, um, my favorite stage is always the one I'm in (laughs) because I love learning new stuff and trying to do new things. And I suppose at some point this could get to where I just hate it and I don't want to do it anymore. But um, I, I don't feel that way. I, I feel like, wow, this is fascinating what I'm trying to figure out now and what I'm learning about being a leader at this scale or with, with incredibly seasoned, co- accomplished executives on my team. I always joke that most of the people that work for me, I should work for them. Like, I don't know. You know, so just that, that, that mindset of there's always something new to learn is what keeps me just super motivated and having fun. Okay, then with that, I mean, what are what should our audience look forward to to seeing you accomplish in the years ahead? Mm. Being an mm. advisor for some companies, being on some others' boards, growing this and, and taking it to a whole nother level. What are some things on the horizon? Well, well certainly my my primary focus is is SailPoint in 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 this era with our new friends at Toma Bravo, who just you know bought bought the bulk of the company and took it private. I, they understand that I am committed to them to help us drive a great outcome which again, probably looks like either heading toward going public, possibly going public, possibly getting acquired somewhere along that journey, maybe before going public, maybe after, and maybe never getting acquired and just continuing to grow. At some point, I will, as they say, age out, I suppose. But um, but I don't think that's any time too soon. I'm a very young 60. Let's go with that. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, I'm I'm looking forward to this when there is some change that causes me not to be doing this full time, I'm pretty sure I'll look at boards and, and various flavors of, of kind of other things like that. What I know I'll do, cause you can do it as you and I said earlier, whether you're on a board or not, I love mentoring and guiding and helping people along their journey. And, and often as you and I were talking kind of not just their professional journey, like, Hey, I'd love to help you be a really successful CEO or leader or whatever you're doing. I'd also like to make sure you kind of have a good life. Like, let's talk about, again, all those things we said, your, 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 your significant others and your kids and your health and maybe your spiritual journey. Like, I, I've just gotten to an age now, I look back and see a lot of people who overly focused on their business slash financial success, and they didn't pay enough attention to those other things. And those are sad stories. I just, I'd like to help more younger uh, future successful people navigate to a place where you can, you can have a bit of both. There's a dangerous, you can have it all thought, but like you really can navigate to have a reasonably good outcome in all those dimensions, but you have to be very intentional about that. And I think helping people along that journey is, is super motivating for me. Okay. If you have any last words of advice on how to go down that journey, you know, now's the time. If not, we'll, we'll wrap it up with that. And if anyone wants to find out more information about you, what you're working on, what's the best way to go about doing that? Okay, let me see if I can land with something summer, summary sounding. Um, we didn't exactly hit this, but I think it's a nice way to land this and it kind of have hinted at it. I think the most successful people I've seen, again, both professionally and personally, are quite self-aware. In other words, you, you sort of know what you're good at, you know what you're not as good at. That means, back to what you and I were talking about earlier, you know what is my leadership capability? Where should I or can I scale? What are the functional things I'm good at? What are the contexts in which I seem to both succeed and or enjoy myself? So I think I think a lot of like what I encourage people is to be honest with yourself in your own head, what you like to do, what you're good at. I, I won't get it right, but there's it's in Colin's book and some of the other books have kind of, you know, we're there's various flavors of this kind of where your interests or passions and the world's needs, you know, come together. <laughs> that's a place of success, right? Like, what are you good at? What is something that's needed? What do you enjoy doing? Put all that together and keep looking for how you stay in the center of that as much as possible. Um, 
I think if people think about that a lot, then they won't find themselves waking up 10 years into some job they hate and going, what did I just do? How did I land here for 10 years? Um, so that's kind of the, the personal, you know, try, try to think about those things and be intentional. Yeah. Look, in terms of me, there's, there's, um, there's our company. Certainly, if you would like to buy some enterprise security software focused on identity, that's us at SailPoint, www.salepoint.com. Um, and then I did write a book, and some folks find that interesting to kind of see what I thought about leadership. It's called Joy and Success, with an and kind of crossing out the or on the cover, uh, at work. And the subtitle is worth more fun, Building Organizations That Don't Suck, comma, the life out of people. So it's sort of like, how do you build a great org and also an org that kind of helps people feel good about being there. Um, those were the kind of things I tried to capture in the book. Fantastic. We'll have all that information in the show notes. Once again, I want to thank Robert for the amazing introduction that led to today's interview. And for our audience out there, what I'm not the host of the Silicon Valley podcast, I'm an investment banker focused on mergers, acquisition, growth capital, secondaries. Connect with me on my LinkedIn at Sean Flynn, S-H-A-W-N-F-L-Y-N-N. And Follow us on the Silicon Valley Podcast.com. Once again, that's the Silicon Valley Podcast.com, where we have all our past episodes. And for our audience out there, I'm not sure if you noticed one thing. Write in the comments, send me an email of what your thoughts. Mark, Jim McKelvey, there's a couple of our past guests that had a similar speech pattern. If you can mention that in the comments, you'll get a prize. All right. Leave everyone with the teaser right there. And once again, thank you. And Mark, I want to thank you again for your time on this week's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. Thank you, Sean. It was a pleasure to be here. Hope hope, hope you and your uh, listeners continue to have great success. Take care.